Hello, and welcome to Central Booking, where writers and readers are the authority. I'm your host, John Valeri. On today's episode, it's three Janes, a Josie, a John, and a Jack, as Jane K. Cleland makes a return visit to Central Booking. Tell me you're not intrigued. Jane is the award-winning author of the Josie Prescott Antiques Mystery Series, the 14th of which, Jane Austen's Lost Letters, comes out on December 14th. In this latest caper, Josie comes into possession of two letters allegedly written by literary luminary Jane Austen when a mysterious acquaintance of her deceased father, who perished in the 9-11 attacks, delivers them to Prescott's antiques before making a hasty exit. Stymied by the person, the present, and the implications about the past, Josie is set adrift. Then, she has the distinct misfortune of discovering the dead body of an expert documentarian, which leads her down an all-too-familiar path of mayhem, misdeeds, and murder. Needless to say, past and present collide in clever and cunning ways. Jane herself once owned an antiques and rare books business, so she and Josie make a formidable match, using their knowledge of antiques to solve crimes and enthrall readers. It's a tried-and-true formula that has allowed the venerable series to stay fascinating and fresh despite its familiar charms. That tradition continues in Jane Austen's Lost Letters, which was named a Best Cozy of 2021 by Aunt Agatha's. Further, Publishers Weekly called the book beguiling and noted that Cleland maintains tension from the opening pages right up to the surprise conclusion. Miss Austin would approve. I highly suspect that you will too. In the meantime, Jane K. Cleland is here to tell us how she found the premise and the plot of Jane Austen's Lost Letters. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Central Booking. I am very happy today to be in conversation with award-winning author Jane K. Cleland, whose new novel, Jane Austen's Lost Letters, is out on December 14th. Here it is. Look at that gorgeous cover, and welcome back to the show, Jane. Oh, thank you, and thank you so much, John. It's a great pleasure to be here. Oh, it's always nice to visit with you. You know, I was thinking to myself, it would be fun to start this show with like a little joke, like two Janes and a Josie walk into a bar or an antique <laughs> shop, but then I couldn't really think of where to go with it. So, you know, if anybody out there has an idea, just let us know. Um, but anyway, you know, I wanted to ask you... One little thing. Oh, yes. Two Janes and a Josie walk into a bar and spend time with Jack. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yes. <laughs> But you have to know I'm a Jack Daniels drinker in order you do, to do, but it's building. I like where your mind goes with this. I should have known you would have something to add there. This could be like one of those stories or like a game of telephone, you know, just keep adding. It just keep it. going. Yeah, we'll see where it ends up, but it probably won't be very cozy, will it? Um <laughs> But anyway, I wanted to ask you, of course, first about this new book, because it's got a really compelling, intriguing premise. And basically what happens for people who haven't read it yet uh, is Josie Prescott, sort of, she comes into possession of some correspondence allegedly written by Jane Austen that have been lost to time. Um, so, you know, great premise. And I'm wondering if you can just tell us where this idea spun from and if you have any particular affinity for Jane Austen yourself. You and I both know the wonderful librarian, now retired from Westport, Connecticut, Jane Murphy. Yes. Another Jane. Another Jane. <laughs> I, Jane and I were talking, and I was explaining how really the hardest part for me conceptually is coming up with an antique worthy of writing about. It, it's actually harder than you think. Uh, it has to be either worth enough money or have enough importance historically or sentimental that it has to be worth killing for. And uh, an example that I can give you of the complexity is um, cruise ship menus. Back in the golden day of cruising in the 1920s and a little early, a little later, uh, first class menus were commissioned art. Uh, they were they had a cover that was commissioned art and then you opened and it was calligraphy and there were fewer than a hundred made. Um, and one of the components of value is scarcity. If there were only a hundred made, how many could possibly be extant? So I thought, ooh, original art, that kind of golden age and right. cruise ships and the people, I could just see the glamorous dresses the women were wearing and the tuxes and the cocktails, and I thought it would be great fun, and that the 
menus, you know, well, what stories they could tell if only they could talk. And by the way, they were three a day, right? Breakfast, lunch, dinner. Right. Different for each day and each meal. Turns out they have absolutely no value. I mean, you can get them fairly easily at flea markets for 10 bucks each. I have no idea why. And I could just feel the air come out of my little idea balloon. You know how the balloon, the thought, right, the cartoon, right. it's, yeah, it just deflated <laughs> I, because it has no value. So there Jane and I are talking and I explained and I used that example and she just narrowed her little eyes and looked at me and said, Jane Austen's letters. <laughs> and I was like, huh. And so the next step is that I began doing research and I discovered two things that made me say this will work and catapulted the plot into motion. One was that no one knows how many letters exist. She was a dedicated letter writer. They think maybe as many as 3,100 letters over her lifetime. They don't know because shortly after her death and then a generation later, various relatives burned them. And they burned them because they thought they were a little too personal. She was too outgoing and they were protecting the literary legacy. That's the theory about why they were doing it. Right. As far as anyone knows, there's only 161 letters that exist. Wow. I know. And then that was one fact. In 2019, a scrap of six lines that had been carefully cut out of one of her letters surfaced. It was found in a scrapbook here in America. It's like, come on. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you can just imagine right. what must have been cut out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was about laundry. It was about linen. This one needed darning and that one didn't. Scandalous. Inexplicable. <laughs> but here's was my thinking. If six lines cut out nicely from one of her letters could surface more than 200 years after it was written, and who knows how long after it disappeared, what was to say there aren't other letters that are in a scrapbook or a trunk in someone's attic or misfiled in a museum drawer? Why not? Absolutely. And Jane Murphy does get a dedication in this book, obviously well earned, <laughs> but that's a great, you know, genesis for a story. Uh, and so I wanted to ask you too, the letters are delivered to Josie by Veronica Sutton, who's sort of an enigmatic woman, and she claims to have known Josie's father, and we'll talk about him in a moment, but that's really, you know, all she'll say. And then she sort of runs out, Josie has no way to be in contact with her, and she's of course very curious. Um, and it opens sort of murky ethical territory for Josie, which is unusual. I mean, she's a solid uh, moral person who sees the world in black and white. You know, there's not a lot of gray area for her and all of a sudden she is amidst it. So I'm wondering if you can, you know, tell us about that, that murky moral landscape that she finds herself in with Veronica Sutton. I find that the theme of all my writing, and I'm putting it that way, not just the Josie novels, but uh, I've written some short stories that were not Josie, and I've written two books on the craft of writing, Mastering Suspense, Structure, and Plot, and Mastering Plot Twists, both of which use, I, I create case studies, and I use little mini memoirs to make the points that I want to make. And I find that as I do that, almost all my writing is thematically about finding community. I, I think that is one of the responsibilities of adulthood, that you don't just find where you are able to fit in, but you find where you truly belong, if you're lucky. I love that. You find yourself Luck, isn't that right? Uh, with like-minded people who value you for who you are, 
not who you pretzel yourself to be in order to adhere to the mores of any certain group. And that is the, I would say the origin of that moral dilemma is that if her father had wanted her to know that he'd had a good friend named Veronica Sutton, and he must have, because she knew too much about him and gave her these letters and a note from him, I, he would have told her. And she had thought that they were as close as peas in a pod. So why would he have withheld this information? And if he didn't want her to know, is it her responsibility to honor that implication? Or is she now a fully grown adult allowed to take her where her own curiosity leads her and find out the darn truth? Consequences be darned. And that's the dilemma. Sure. I actually don't think for me personally, it wouldn't be a dilemma at all. I would just go find out. <laughs> How about you? Would you too? I, I think I'd have to. <laughs> yeah, I don't even think I'd have a second thought. It's like, because really on one level, that dilemma is you were not wanting me to know. And now there's something to know that you are hiding. I'm going to find out. Or you've been lying to me. I owe you nothing. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a really fascinating entry point, you know, into this book. And the character is so well written that you start questioning your own judgment and what you would do because she's so, you know, sort of torn in her own decision making. Um, but let me ask you too, you know, and you touched upon this already, but, you know, Josie's dad passed. He actually perished in the 9-11 attacks and this occurred before the first book was written. Um, but he's been a character in the books because we hear some of Josie's memories, some of the sayings um, that, you know, she continues on that he would say. And, you know, we think that they really did have this ideal relationship as close as a father or daughter could be. And then she really has to reevaluate his character and their relationship dynamics. That happens throughout this book. And then there's also the fact that, you know, he perished in the 9-11 attacks. And of course, we find ourselves 20 years later. So it resonates, you know, on that level as well. So I'm just wondering if, you know, you can talk about the emotional impact of everything that's going on in Josie's life. I knew when I wrote book one, and Jane Austen's Lost Letters is book 14 in the series, but I should mention that they're written as standalones. You can just jump into the series anywhere. Um, yes, there's things that will have happened that you'll have to infer, but that's okay. You'll catch up. You'll do just fine with that. I knew that Josie's dad had died in 9-11 before I wrote the first book. Josie cried a lot in that uh, first book. And even in book two, she was still pretty emotional. And for those of us that were here, that are Americans and were metaphorically here, even if we weren't literally here in New York on 9-11, that's not the kind of thing you get over. Right. Isn't that right? I mean, you move on you file it away somewhere. But I suggest to my readers that it infiltrates our view of the world, our view of empathy, kindness, right and wrong, revenge, vengeance, the amount of BS we might be willing to put up with, before we say life is too short, I'm not doing this anymore, and so on. I, I, I think it was one of those events in my life that was just completely pivotal and from which there is no return. You know, that's actually the definition in writing. Um, when you talk about the inciting incident, that thing that catapults your story forward, it is often defined, or at least I define it as 
that thing, that incident from which your protagonist can't not turn back and is forever changed. It's 9-11. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting because I feel like for my generation, that is sort of the pivotal point. And for my parents, it was the Kennedy assassination. So if you look back in history, there are always these historical events that stand out from one generation to another. But it's interesting too, because you have this personal grief and then this collective grief because it was such a huge loss shared by so many uh, in so many different ways. But I just did want to acknowledge that because you know it's an interesting time um, to be reading this book and to sort of relive that. And I think a lot of people will relate to that. Yeah, um, I did that on purpose. Sure. This was sure. the 20th anniversary book. Absolutely. Um, and so, of course, you know, it wouldn't be a Josie Prescott novel if there wasn't a murder or two. Um, you know, not that there's not plenty going on with the Jane Austen letters, but you throw in a murder or two and then, you know, it's all in the pot. But I wanted to ask you about that, too, because when she receives these letters, um, Josie is sort of deeply entrenched in recording a new episode of her show. Um, and she has two experts who are good-naturedly, I'm going to say, pitted against each other, sort of a battle of the experts. There are two experts to authenticate letters. Um, they're appearing on Josie's show and then murders, you know, start to happen and Josie realizes that there is some kind of connection. So I'm wondering if you can tell us just a bit about who these experts are, who their entourages are, um, and what the dynamic is between them and why that motivates Josie to try to figure out what happened, despite the fact that, you know, then it opens her up to personal risk. You know, it's, it's interesting. It, I have learned over the years that no matter what industry you're in, no matter what field you're in, there's competition. And competition takes many forms. In the business world, it's who's earning the most money or whose business has the most international locations or whatever metric you're going to use. In the high-end antiques and documents and book world, it is who has the best reputation, who is hired as an expert witness most, whose word is considered gold as opposed to silver or bronze. And they strut a little and they engage in some perhaps good natured, perhaps not so good natured repartee. In thinking about the people who would do this, I really enjoy writing opposites. So I wanted one to be a woman, one to be a man. I wanted one to be an open expert as in a star in the field. And the other who climbed his way up the rungs, got himself certified, has some experience under his belt. That's very different than uh, hitting a home run your first time at bat. one of them to be scholarly, one of them to come from a business orientation. And that's what I did. So those are the two experts. And I, I enjoyed their interactions. But one of my favorite characters, their entourage, um, they were each allowed to bring one guest because Josie's television studio, you know, she does do a show called Josie's Antiques. It's been on for several years now. Number one on cable in her <laughs> slot, in her time slot. Uh, the woman who's the star brings her graduate assistant, which is really nice of her because he's a PhD candidate and he's trying to learn all aspects of the business. So for her to use her one guest slot for a student is really um, generous of her. The other fellow, the climb up from, you know, raise yourself up by your bootstrap fellow, he brings his mom and she is one of my favorite characters. What a card she is. <laughs> She's around 60 and uh, she rides, you know, dirt bikes and her knee is healing from a toss she took. And I'll, I mean, I could quote several of her lines. I know it's my own writing and it's probably unseemly to be laughing at your own writing, but I think it was really funny what I wrote. When Josie says, you rode a dirt bike, she says, I don't like your diction. I ride dirt bikes. <laughs> That's funny. And of course, she, my favorite is that she has an idea to, on you know, if the books are old, they must smell musty. Why don't you spray them with Febreze? <laughs> she, 
And, you know, there's a five, six, seven, eight, as everybody pauses and her son says, we don't spray books with Febreze, mom. The scary well, thing right? is she works in his shop. <laughs> Not only knows what she's been doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. She works in the rare bookstore. Oh, golly gee. <laughs> Yeah, she was a lot of fun to write. She was a lot of fun to read. It was one of those things like, you know, you don't know what's going to come out of her mouth next, but you're just waiting for it because you know it's going to be that good. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> and so, of course, there's all this competition. And I will say that Murder and Susan, you do a fabulous job of bringing these, you know, two very distinct storylines together. I kept wondering how that was going to happen. And then, you know, the bulb went off. Um, but yes, so in addition to Jane Austen's letters, there are murders. You will enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> what a conversation we're having. We kill people and you're going to love it. <laughs> yeah. All fictional, of course. <laughs> yeah, well, they always say to writers, write what you know. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I think that means by now I've killed 19, maybe 20 people. <laughs> you're very prolific. On the page, <laughs> off the page. <laughs> devoted to your craft and I admire Oh that. yes, yes. And I kill them in lots of different ways, but always tastefully. <laughs> yes, tastefully. It's discreet when there's something to be said for discreet. So let me ask you too. So something I really like is, you know, we were talking a bit about Josie's Antiques, the show that she has been involved with now for several years. Um, and I feel like, you know, as the series has evolved, we've gotten sort of more into that world. And I feel like this book, we may see the most of it that we've seen yet. You know, we spend a lot of time on set, you know, with Josie and the surrounding cast. And I'm wondering if you can talk about, you know, your own experiences with television or your research into the topic. How do you bring that alive believably, but also, you know, give us the details that are fascinating without bogging down the story? Oh, thank you. You know, one of the truisms I think about uh, readers is that they like learning new things. And I think that's why antiques works nicely hmm. as a uh, theme in the book, a, a, a fact. I guess it's a plot. There's always a I always have at least a secondary plot of another antique. And this, in Jane Austen's Lost Letters, it's thimbles, collectible <laughs> thimbles. Um, so I felt very comfortable sharing some facts that I thought people would be interested in to try to give a feel, not so much about the, the boring sitting around waiting parts, but the, the magic, the drama, the how, what happens behind the camera translates to what's on the camera. And so I did things like, um, they wanted to pink Josie up a little <laughs> because her skin was just too sallow. And you do that by putting in another gel or a different gel. And those are very thin plastic colored um, sheets that lighting designers use or layer in the bright, maybe Klieg lighting, maybe other kind of lighting that really change the complexion and not just a person's complexion, but they also want to match the atmosphere of the scene. And they, that's what lighting designers do. It's a great talent and not, not easy at all because you also have to consider ambient lighting and the background and whether the rug is going to observe, absorb the light and so on. So it's, it's quite complex. So I don't go into that level of complexity. I just talk about pinking her up and they put in a new pink seashell pink uh, gel. I have been on television sets um, because my undergraduate degree was actually in theater. So I studied to be an actress and as part of my career as an author, I have been interviewed on TV. And what I remember most about both of those experiences is being extremely careful not to trip over the cables. <laughs> they're huge and they're omnipresent. They're everywhere. And sometimes they're layered so that you have electric and then cables going to digital stuff and then other cables going to the lighting stuff and they're stacked and taped. And you have to step quite high to get over them. I don't 
don't know why you don't hear about more people doing face plants on. <laughs> I just anyway, I was very scared about it. I also was really impressed at the speed with which they break down the set to get ready for the next set. This is not, you know, you look at CNN or ABC News or whatever, they have multiple stages and sets and they can just go from one to the next. But in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where I was on television or other places that are smaller markets, they have one news set and they go for a break and the hands and the grips, that's what they're called, the hands and the grips, they whip on, they whip on and all of a sudden you blink twice and it's a different set because they're doing the news about traffic and then they're doing an interview with a local, with the author coming for a local visit. And now we need two comfortable chairs and a little coffee table with flowers on it. <laughs> and they've done it with a different backdrop in about 30 seconds, it's astonishing. So I wanted to create that sense of urgency and, um, and seriousness. I mean, these people are working professionals. It is, they, they may enjoy their jobs, I think they do, but it is work and it is often very physical work and they take it very seriously. Yeah, stakes are high, <laughs> you know, you don't wanna be the one to mess it up. Um, but it's a lot of fun. I'll mention, I'll mention just one other, John, because I thought it was interesting is the costume, costume gal who can spot a change in nail polish and a hanging thread from 50 yards because her primary job is continuity. Because if they're filming from one day to the next, you can't have these subtle changes that will change the lighting perhaps or astute viewers will notice. Yeah, and that's our job, right? I mean, I feel like whenever I sit down to watch something, I'm looking to see, you know, what's changed. Hey, your hair is different, you know. Um, but and it's great. And I think it's a great way to have evolved the series, too, because you get Josie a bit, you know, out of her element in the sense that, you know, her business is growing. So there's more structure. There's it's just a lot of fun. Um, and I wanted to ask you, too, talking about growth and evolution. But, you know, a couple of books back, Josie actually tied the knot. You know, she got married to her long term boyfriend. Ty, and I wanted to, you know, talk about that because sometimes, you know, when you go from a uh, dating relationship to marriage, things may not always be as fresh as they were, especially in a book, you know, um, and if you have somebody who's around and underfoot all the time, you may lose a bit of your autonomy because you're not just thinking about what you're doing for yourself and your own purposes, but for the other person, you know, you have somebody waiting at home, they want you to come home safe. So you might not find yourself in some of the situations that Josie gets into. However, you know, Ty works for Homeland Security, travels a lot. So, you know, he's very much there for her, um, sometimes at a distance. So can you talk about, you know, how you marry, um, taking these characters, putting them together, starting a life together, a new home, but also letting them still be autonomous? In one of the books five, six ago, I had written it where Ty used to be the police chief of the town. And my editor thought Josie was becoming a little dependent on his expertise, his knowledge of the town, his knowledge of the people. And she was like, get him out of town. <laughs> so I had to kill his aunt Trina, sorry. <laughs> and she lived in California. So I got him out of town for the entire book. <laughs> But she came back with a ring that was, he was able to give a ring to Josie. That was from Aunt Trina, which was a little homage from my part to the fact that I had to kill her off. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a category in crime fiction. You know, there's so many subgenres. There's noir, private eye, paranormal. There's a thriller, traditional, cozy, and so on. And one of the categories is women in jeopardy. And women in jeopardy rely on men to save them. And I have a lot of men in Josie's life. Wes, the reporter who has tentacles everywhere and helps her find stuff out. And Max, her lawyer, who is a rock when she needs it. And um, Chief Hunter, Ellis Hunter, who's her friend and the new police chief. 
and um, her husband now, Ty, who is um, really connected on emergency management as well as traditional policing levels. There are no women who do this for her. This is, it's all men. Now, why is that? I don't know. Maybe I just like hanging with men. There you go. <laughs> but I have to be extremely careful that it is Josie who solves the crime. Josie who takes the initiative. Josie who showcases her, her chops in physical courage, in expertise, not just antiques expertise, but deductive reasoning. Um, and she is skilled in some survival techniques that come into play. And that's not out of the blue. Those have been planted for many, many books so that the, this should not be a surprise to anybody that she's able to use these kinds of expertise. Um, but that said, there you go. Um, yeah, so that's how I did it, is that I purposefully make her independent, but she has, remember my theme of finding community, these people all figure into her rather tight knit community of her own choosing. Right. Yeah, and I, I think it speaks to the point, you know, we really can't make our own families. And I think especially as we enter adulthood, you know, that becomes more common. And I think one of the things that people really respond to in these books is that Josie has crafted this amazing community of people, the people that she works with, you know, are her family and they're wonderful. And as much as you want to revisit Josie, you want to see all of them too and see what they're, you know, up to because they grow and evolve um, as well. So it's sort of an entire ensemble, which is a, a really beautiful thing. And I think it draws people back again and again and again, like you said, book 14, plus some short stories. I mean, that's a long literary life and it's not stopping, so. Oh, well, thank you. And, you know, one of the reviews that from Jim Wang um, that was really most meaningful to me was that I had created an environment at Prescott's where everyone wants a job. <laughs> it's true. I, why wouldn't you want to work with that? And that must be so refreshing to have that attitude getting up every morning. Like, I want to be there with my people. Um, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so I'm going to move off the topic of Jane Austen's Lost Letters for a bit and have a bit of fun with you and ask you some questions that I don't normally get to ask people. Uh, so what some people shouldn't be surprised to know, I guess, is that once in your life you owned an antiques and rare books business. So I'm wondering, you know, if you can tell us a bit about a book, what makes a book rare and what steps would you take to actually show that? And that, I guess, is a reflection of this book too, because there is sort of a, um, a storyline about a Beatrix Potter book, but I'm always fascinated by that. So if you could give us some insight into that industry. Sure, oh. sure. Um, Josie and most reputable antiques dealers uses a hundred years as the delineation on when something can be considered an antique. So the first thing you know about a rare book, if it's gonna be called rare, is that it's more than a hundred years old. So beyond that rare book being a hundred years old or older, here are the factors that contribute to assessing value. First, we have to make sure it's authentic. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Then we have to find out how many were originally printed and how many are extant. So that's the difference between rarity and scarcity. It can be rare because only a hundred were printed, but if only two exist, wow, that's now really scarce. What condition is it in? Normal wear and tear is okay, although if it was never opened, that would be even better. Um, not read, uh, just treasured on a bookshelf because then it's gonna be in perfect condition. We want to know if it was ever owned by anyone important historically or because he was the governor of Maine or because it was Marilyn Monroe's favorite book of poetry. So important, interesting, that's called association. And then of course, trends. There's trends in book collecting like in anything else. And that will be reflected in past pricing. 
you can't just look at past auction prices, which is in the open market. You know, collecting rare books, it's one of the last bastions of pure capitalism, right? Something is really worth what someone else will pay for it. True. And at auction, you get a sense of what the market will pay for it. But it's not the only factor because it could be, for example, someone who has a, a full collection of Stephen King books, but wants Salem's Lot, the first, one of the rarest books out there. And if that comes up, because it would complete the collection of first editions, um, that collector may be willing to pay premium. Put all those together and you get an assessment of value. Now, how do you tell whether something is authentic? This is um, usually quite tricky. If a book is popular enough that someone might want to try to commit a fraud and create a fake to sell as if it were real, that's quite an investment of time and energy. And so it's only going to happen with the most valuable of items. In other words, if you're looking at a $100 rare book or even a $500 rare book, probably you don't have to worry if it has been authenticated. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. But, you know, if you're looking at a $4 million book, that's probably worth putting in a little time and energy to create a fake. So you do have to be more careful. There are tells usually in a book. And if you turn over the title page, the reverse of the title page is where the copyright information is. And there are going to be known um, anomalies that you can research and look up. There are books and scholars on the subject that are known. And certainly you would take it to a rare book dealer who does appraisals and they will be able to do this for you. And that's how you can begin to tell if it's a genuine first edition. First editions are really the things that are collectible. There are some exceptions to that, but it's rare. Um, then there are sometimes word changes. An author decides to change a word between the first edition and the second edition. That is another known anomaly so that if I know that, I can turn to page 53 and see which word is there, and then I'll know which edition I have, or I have a better chance of that. Once you get into, once you've done all of that kind of research, now we're beginning to look at paper and ink and the aging. They can do carbon dating. And there's new technologies now that really can begin to do quite, I mean, we're, we're talking DNA testing of paper that can tell you what tree it came from. Yes, this is true. And, I, I, you know, you're not gonna spend that money and do that level of research unless it's a $4 million right. book that someone's, or a $40 million. So there you go. That's how you tell if something's rare and how you look at it. Yeah, that's so fascinating. <laughs> Isn't uh, it fascinating? Uh, I it find really it is. <laughs> it's incredible. And so I want to ask you, I don't know if you were a collector or not, or a collector of books specifically, but, you know, let's just theorize for a moment here and pretend that you are. If you could own any rare book or a particular edition of a rare book that you don't already possess, what book would it be and why? <laughs> ah, there are so many. <laughs> uh, I would really like to own a first edition of Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language, the mm. first dictionary in English. He has some wonderful definitions and um, it's just such an important book in the evolution of English. Um, my husband and I play um, card games that are often better with four people. And because we're just two, we each play two hands. <laughs> my husband is a musician. So he plays with uh, Johann Bach. Uh, we call him Johnny. <laughs> I play with Shakespeare. We call him Will. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> I would also like to own um, a first edition of the collected works of William Shakespeare. That's fabulous. 
Great choices. And I love the dictionary. I would not have thought, but it kind of makes sense, especially for, you know, a writer. Fabulous. All right. So another kind of different question for you, but we are, you know, by the time people see this, we will be entrenched in the holiday season. People are shopping like mad, whether it's in stores or online. Um, and, you know, the older I grow, the more fond I have become of giving books as presents or of receiving them, though people, you know, enter into that with some trepidation because they assume I own everything. <laughs> you know, it's hard to buy me a book. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, for people who are looking to gift books, keeping in mind that it's very subjective, what advice or guidance would you give to people looking to do that? And do you have any recommendations that you would make based on your own reading preferences? Thank you. I, I think that's a wonderful question. And I've spent some time thinking about it. I, I think that the best gifts are those that are meaningful to the recipient. And so I would encourage people to give people books that you know people will enjoy. Now, how do you know that? Um, well, one of my friends, her favorite author is Jodi Picot. And I was able to get a signed edition of My Sister's Keeper. Mm. And she'd read it before, but she didn't have a signed edition. And I can't, she still thanks me for it. I, it was so meaningful to her. Um, one of my good friends, I'm reaching over to show a couple of things. Um, one of my good friends know, and I, we share um, a love of poetry. Um, I'm sure you know her, this is Paula Manier. Oh yeah. A wonderful author, literary agent, editor. And she gave me the great cat. She knows how much I like cats. And she gave me this little poetry book about cats. And I'm going to digress for a moment and read you a couple of lines from my favorite poem from oh, the book. It's called, This is My Chair. This is my chair. Go away and sit somewhere else. This one is all my own. It is the only thing in your house that I possess and insist upon possessing. Everything else herein is yours. My dish, my toys, my basket, my scratching post, and my ping pong ball. You provided them for me. This chair I selected for myself. I like it. It suits me. You have the sofa, the stuffed chair, and the footstool. I don't go and sit on them, do I? Mm -hmm. Then why cannot you leave me mine and let us have no further argument? Well, if that doesn't <laughs> okay. shift your perspective a little bit. <laughs> that's the whole poem. I couldn't resist. I read it all. <laughs> so that's just so meaningful because it's based on a shared love of poetry and an interest of mine cats and it's just charming. Um, I gave her the collected works of Robert Frost mm. um, and I annotated a little bit. That's my favorite poet. She now lives in New Hampshire. So I thought that would be a nice connection. And when I say I annotated, I use little post-it flags to highlight a couple of lines that are so meaningful to me. And I'll tell you, Two of them, one is from um, Ode to a Handyman. I think Handyman is in the title. I think that's the name. Home is where, when you get there, they have to let you in. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> and this is from Once by the Pacific, written in 1929. We are entering a night of dark intent not just a night, an age. Someone had better be prepared for rage. Isn't that something? Yeah. So, and you know, she enjoyed that as well. Um, in my collection, my books, <clears throat> Ornaments of Death. This is um, a Josie Prescott set at Christmas time. <clears throat> Excuse me, I wanted to celebrate the idea of family in all its range. Um, Josie is the only child of only children. 
So as far as she knew, she had no family. And in this book, she discovers a distant cousin, an Englishman named Ian and his daughter. And it is the story of them coming together and the loss that might result. And Christmas ornaments, and I, I thought the clever, the cover design was very clever. I'm gonna hold it quite close to the camera. Um, Arabella Churchill and King James II had an affair. And there you can see that among the other ornaments, and there of course is Hank, the wonderful Prescott's cat. There's Hank, Dane Coon, based on one of mine, named Louie. Um, for my husband, if there's a new Stephen King book out, he gets it, that's his favorite author. And it, it doesn't matter that I had to stop reading Stephen King a generation ago, because I like, I mean, the best storyteller I know, but terrifying, there's broad <laughs> daylight, I'm locking all the windows, wedging chairs under the doorknobs. And I said to myself, I'm never reading Stephen King again. This is not healthy for my heart. And he likes it. And sure. that's the point of a thoughtful gift. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's that's wonderful. And I will say Ornaments of Death is like a wonderful Christmas read. If you are a mystery lover and you like things a little bit more cozy and traditional, it's it's really a great book. You'll be a little scared, but not too terrified. No, not scared. I don't think at all. We just no. kill people tastefully. Yes, but also, I would hope that your readers would give, you know, if they like Jane Austen, give them Jane Austen's Lost Letters. If they like traditional mysteries, Jane Austen's Lost Letters. It, you know, this is the new book in the series. And give them two. Give them Ornaments to Death and Jane Austen's Lost Letters. It would be very um, helpful to me as an author if uh, your viewers buy the book. Absolutely. And it really is. I think the perfect gift. I mean, we all need a little escapism. And especially now, when so many of us stay so close to home, that you can travel anywhere in a book and you know that you're safe and you know you're with characters that you actually care about. And as you mentioned before, um, the wonderful thing about these Josie Prescott books is you can pick anyone up and know that you're going to get a standalone story. You will get a feel for the characters, but the plot always stands alone. So you do not have to read them in order. You don't miss too much if you don't. And then there's the beauty in getting to go back and discovering them from the beginning, which I always think is fun. Um, yeah. Having said that, I just realized that I have been with you since your very first book. And there's not a lot of authors I can say that about. But I remember meeting you in Connecticut when book number one came out a while ago, probably longer than either one of us would, you know, care to well, admit. Well, I think it would be 2005 is probably. So that's a long time ago. Yeah, and here we are. It's been a pleasure to know you this whole time. And you as well. And I feel like the longer I know you, the more I get to know about you. And it's it's a lot of fun. It's like peeling back the layers of the onion, you know, if you were an onion. <laughs> if, if you were an onion, which kind? I'd be Bermuda. <laughs> That's a fun onion. I like that. <laughs> all right. So final question for you. You know, I have to ask. We've, you know, talked about all the books that have come before. So now I'm going to ask what comes next. And that can be for Josie or it can be for you because you do do things that are non-Josie related. I have uh, been holding free monthly webinars on the craft of writing and the business of writing, but mostly the craft. Um, they're free. Go to my website, janecleland.com, navigate to events. You have to register so we know where to send the webinar link, but it is free. And I started them at the beginning of the pandemic because all of my in-person events were canceled, what you were saying have to stay close to home. And I missed hanging out with writers. And it's been enormously gratifying for me and for um, the people. I get such wonderful feedback. So I'm continuing to do that, even though the world is now beginning to open up. And I see myself doing that in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. As an offshoot of that, I'm now doing small group workshops, um, limited to five people over six sessions, uh, mystery masterminds, uh, writing our cozy together, writing a thriller together. And it's all virtual online. And what's so exciting about that is I'm just, this is the, I'm in the midst of the first go and they sold out like within an hour. It was incredible, really. Um, there are people from Canada and 
Washington State, Texas, Florida, Washington, Michigan, Washington DC, Michigan, one upstate New York, all over. And we never in a million years would have been able to work together in this close one-on-one -on -one or one-on-five environment, if not for the pandemic converting us all to being more comfortable. Converting is the wrong word because I still love in person, but to, to making it accessible uh, in a more meaningful way. So thank you, Zoom. And thank you for my, uh, to me, for powering through a lot of the technical challenges to become comfortable with Zoom. Um, and it's, that's been very gratifying. So I'm certainly gonna continue all that. I'm doing um, videos now of some of the topics that have seemed most meaningful to people. And once I figure that all out with worksheets and exercises and questions and answers, that will become available. So I'm spending a lot of time on the craft elements. And I do that for two reasons, because I enjoy it and it helps people, but it also helps me. I, I wrote both of my books on the craft of writing, Mastering Suspense, Structure and Plot, Mastering Plot Twists. And may I say, I mean, this just, my cup runneth over when I say this, the books are recommended by David Balducci, Dan Brown, Louise Penny, Neil Gaiman. I mean, ah! Names you might have heard. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, it's really very gratifying. And the reason that I did it in the first place and continue to do it is I'm trying to become a better writer. By researching what has worked for others and really drilling down into the nuts and bolts of not just what they do, but how they do it, I'm then training myself to apply those lessons. And I think my writing has gotten better. I'm applying it now to a standalone. And I've been working on this book for maybe five years. I think I'm on my 42nd draft. It's incredibly painful, but also gratifying when I write a sentence that I think is good. <laughs> um, and I am this open about it because I want other writers to know it's okay to be on the 42nd draft. No right. one says you have to get it right the first time. You just have to keep on pursuing. And um, I'm hopeful that I'm on the right track and then I'm going to make progress with it. <sighs> <laughs> And while you do that, we all get to enjoy Jane Austen's Lost Letters. You know, you need to read the book. They have been found. Figure out why and how. And, you know, Jane will be on draft 43. And then hopefully we will be holding that book in our hands. But I love that you shared that because, one, you know, what you're doing really is creating a sense of community for so many readers and writers who are looking for like-minded people and can now do that without having to leave home. Um, but also, I love that you share so candidly about your own struggles uh, because then we realize that we're not in this alone and writing is not easy. It's a lot of work and it doesn't matter how many drafts you do until you get it right. But, you know, you're not going to get it right unless you start to do it. So That's right. And, you know, writing is hard. It's hard on so many levels. You have to have a worthy idea. You have to have characters that can carry the idea. You have to develop incidents that support the idea. And then you have to be able to write. You have to have, write prose that is fresh and new and evocative. You have to be good at a lot of different things. It takes time, it takes energy, commitment. Um, Paula Manier actually is what is the person who said, don't worry about getting it right. Worry about getting it written. You can always go back and revise. So true. It's so Talk true. about words of wisdom. I mean, I think that's a great note to end this on. So Jane Cleland, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. It's always a pleasure chatting. My pleasure. And I do hope your viewers will come to janecleland.com. Poke around. There's lots of tools there for writers and readers. And I uh, hope to see them online at a free monthly webinar. Thank you, John, so much. It's been a great privilege and pleasure as always. Thank you, Jane. And she did say free and she means it. So, you know, it's, it's the thing to do. It's really beneficial. So I would highly suggest that as well. Thank you, Jane. Bye-bye, everyone. That's it for this episode of Central Booking. Thanks for watching. 
and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing.